This evening, we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Second Chronicles. Now, with this as the focus, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 26. And as you make your way to the 26th chapter of Second Chronicles, I just want to take a moment to remind you that we actually find ourselves in a section of Scripture which is focused on the days when the nation of Israel was divided up into two distinct kingdoms. This included the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, knowing that this was the Lord's decision to divide the nation of Israel for their sins of idolatry, this still didn't stop several kings from trying to reunite the two kingdoms back under a uh, single monarchy. And, and this not only included Rehoboam, who initially tried to stop the Lord from splitting the monarchy in two, uh, but this also included King Ahab and King Jehoram, uh, who both tried to uh, reunite the people of Israel uh, through both military endeavors as well as arranged marriages. And yet all of these endeavors ended up only creating further conflict between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and you know, part of the reason why is because they weren't unable to, or they weren't able to undo what God had done. Well, then came the day when Amaziah, the king of Judah, he set out to conquer the kingdom of Israel. And with all foolish pride, King Amaziah invited Joash, the king of Israel, uh, to face him in battle. And, and, and while he was failing to realize that this was actually God's will to divide up the land of promise into these two distinct kingdoms, uh, you know, King Amaziah was actually uh, fighting against the will of God. That's, that's what he was doing. When he set out to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, he was fighting against God's will. And as I always say, if you find yourself fighting against the will of God, guess who's going to lose? <laughs> it's not going to be God. That being the case, you know, the army of Judah was defeated by the army of Israel. And, and, and not only that, but listen, the pride of King Amaziah, it resulted in his own destruction. Well, now here we are in our text tonight, and we learn about the days when Amaziah's son, Uzziah, then became the king of Judah. And much like his father, Amaziah, King Uzziah was a man who humbly followed the Lord at first. He started well. He just didn't finish well. By the end of his life, it was his foolish pride that led him to his own destruction. And as we consider the way that his heartfelt humility gave way to foolish pride, it's my hope that this study tonight will help us to just recognize the importance of maintaining heartfelt humility as we continue to walk by faith with the Lord so that our life doesn't go in the same direction as King Uzziah. Well, with this as the goal, let's turn our attention now to Ezra's account which is found here in 2 Chronicles. If you would look with me here at 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we're going to begin reading there at verse 1. Here we learn that all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. But he, uh, he built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now here in the beginning of this chapter, we learn about the day when Amaziah's son, Uzziah, he became the king of Judah. And for the sake of clarity, Uzziah, who was also known as Azariah, uh, he was made king of Judah after his father Amaziah fled from Judah to Lachish uh, in an attempt to outrun those who were seeking to claim his life. And according to Ezra, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became the king of Judah. As we consider the way that he built the port city of Elath, which was located at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, we can see that Uzziah was this military-minded king who was determined to establish and fortify the border of Judah, which uh, they shared all the way down to the Red Sea, uh, Edomites on one side, Judah on the other. Uh, what's even more important is that Uzziah was a king who was determined to do what was right in the sight of the Lord. 
So the fact that he was a military-minded man, that's great, but he was a spiritual man as well. He wanted to do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And it's for this reason that he, he actually spent time seeking godly guidance from the spiritual leaders who were able to help him to better understand uh, the prophetic word of God. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at 2 Chronicles 26, I want to draw your attention back to verse 5. Here Ezra informs us that King Uzziah sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. What an incredible verse. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. King Uzziah was a man who was seeking the leading of the Lord, and he did this initially by receiving counsel from a priest named Zechariah. Now, not to be confused with the prophet Zechariah, this priest who was also named Zechariah was a spiritual leader who was able to provide King Uzziah with godly guidance, and the reason why is because he had understanding of the visions of God. And as long as the king sought the Lord, God made sure that he prospered in everything that he did. This reminds me of something that the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 1. It's there where we learn that those who delight themselves in the law of the Lord shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Christian, listen, those who will simply seek the Lord with the goal of obeying his word with heartfelt humility this believer will be blessed as we experience the true prosperity of the Lord. And don't hear me say, oh, it's going to be all cash all day long. That's not the point here. God's prosperity can come in in a bunch of different ways. But if you'll seek the Lord according to his holy word, he will make sure that you prosper according to his will. In order to further consider the point that I want to make here, I want to consider the way that the Lord helped King Uzziah to prosper there in the land of Judah. If you would look with me here at 2 Chronicles chapter 26, let's pick up our study beginning at verse 6. Here we learn that he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal and against the Munites. Now here in these verses, we learn about the way that the Lord helped King Uzziah to secure the southwestern border of Judah by conquering those border cities which were located along the wall of this region that we now refer to as the Gaza Strip. And not only that, but listen, the Lord also helped King Uzziah to secure the southeastern border, which uh, Israel currently shares with the Arabs there in Jordan. And to sum it all up, you know, the the king, uh, the, the Lord is helping King Uzziah to prosper by enabling him to secure more and more territory for the kingdom of Judah. His father, his father had focused northwards towards uh, the kingdom of Israel, and, and the Lord spanked him for it. But Uzziah focused southward, and he started acquiring more and more land to the south, and the Lord prospered him uh, in all of this work. Now, as we consider the way that the Lord helped King Uzziah, I just want to point out that the word helped, which is found there in verse 7, it's translated from a Hebrew word which was used of the provision and the protection that the Lord provides to those who set out to accomplish his will. When we set out to accomplish the will of the Lord, he helps us. And in this help comes provision and protection. This reminds me of the encouragement that Paul presents in Hebrews chapter 4. It's verse 16 where he declares, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christian, listen, the Lord is always ready to help those who spend time prayerfully seeking his merciful support. And I, and I get it. Many, many of us grew up you know, hearing our parents say, God helps those who help themselves. All right, you know, maybe that's true at, at times, but I, I, maybe the best way we could help ourselves is just to simply spend some time with the Lord in prayer. Entering the, the throne room where, where the grace of God is experienced relationally. And as we prayerfully enter the throne room of grace, we find that help that we need from the Lord. With that being the case, those who want to prosper with the provision and with the protection of the Lord 
We ought to spend time not trying to help ourselves, but rather we ought to spend time prayerfully seeking the help of the Lord there at the throne of grace. At the same time, it's also important for us to remember that the prosperity provided by the Lord, it's never a reason for personal pride. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's pick up our study of 2 Chronicles 26. If you'll look with me there, beginning at verse 8, here we learn that the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Now, here in these verses, we learn about the way that the fame of King Uzziah continued to grow all the way from Egypt to the land of Ammon, uh, which was you know, north, uh, uh, northeast of the Dead Sea. He was known throughout all of this land, and, and we see here the fame of Uzziah, Uzziah continuing to grow as the military might of Judah continued to increase. Now, I should take a, po- a moment here to point out that the Hebrew word, which is here translated fame, there in verse 8, it could also be rendered reputation. Uh, the same word could also be rendered glory. It's a Hebrew word which can also be rendered name. That's right, this word could be rendered name, and and it's for this reason that the scholars who created the King James Version of the Bible, they render the second half of verse eight in this way. His name spread abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. And so while the New King James Version says fame, the King James Version says name, uh, this is the same Hebrew word. And as we consider how the fame of an individual is all about the glory of their name, we must not fail to recognize the danger that every famous person faces as they run the risk of robbing the glory that actually belongs to the name of the Lord. I get it. A lot of people want their own jersey with their name on the back. A lot of people want their name up in lights. A lot of people want their name to become famous. And as long as that fame is designed to bring glory to God, I don't have a problem with that. But fame for the sake of being famous for your own glory might not work out as well as you were hoping. And one reason why is based on something that the Lord said in Isaiah chapter 42. It's here in Isaiah 42 verse 8 where the Lord declares, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. The famous name of the Lord is all about his glory. And he will not share that glory with us. Now you can try to rob him of that glory. Good luck with that. Let's see how that works out for you. Just go read the tabloids. We can see how that works out for so many. All glory belongs to not my name, not your name, but the name of the Lord. Therefore, those who begin to receive the fame that belongs to the name of the Lord, they should make sure to you know, do their best to remain humble by remembering that God rejects the proud but gives grace to the humble. But that being the case, we should take a moment to consider how King Uzziah set out at the beginning there to stay humble, though his fame was growing. If you would look with me again here at our text tonight, I'd like to draw your attention back to verse 10. Here we learn that he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Here in these verses, we, we see that the king who was building high towers on the, on the mountaintops was also down in the valleys digging the wells. And while his palace was up on Mount Moriah, he was also there in the lowlands where he humbly worked the soil. 
Now, if you'll allow me just a little bit of li- liberty to spiritualize the meaning of, of this verse, it, it seems to me that King Uzziah was attempting to overcome the pride of his own fame by spending more time in the lowland so that he could keep his feet there on solid ground. And, and I think this was, was one way that he was trying to cope with the fame and, and, and the prestige. I, I think that he wanted to go and dig in the dirt and just remind himself where he came from. I'm, re- I'm reminded of the way that John the Baptist addressed this issue of, of pride. You know, his disciples were concerned, you know, because his ministry was kind of on the outs. You know, it, he, he had a popular ministry for a season, but then Jesus came along. And, and next thing you know, the fame of Jesus' name was increasing. And, you know, John the Baptist was kind of like, a, you know, last week's news. And these disciples came to him and they were just kind of like, hey, uh, you know, you're kind of you're losing in the polls here. You're becoming less popular. And, and, you know, this would have been a a perfect opportunity for John the Baptist to say, well, what do we do? You know, maybe uh, maybe we could, you know, put out some flyers or or, or some commercials or, you know, how, how how do we get the fame back? No, that's not what he said. In John chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. I love this response. He's saying, it's not about my fame. It's not about my name. It's not about my ministry. Jesus must increase. And if that means I must decrease, then so be it. We aren't here to establish the fame of our own name. And we haven't been called to promote our own brand or build our own kingdom. No, instead, we've been called to glorify the name which is above every name. And what name is that? Jesus. I like the way that Paul put it in Philippians chapter 2. There he informs us that God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father has exalted the name of Jesus above every other name. And with that being the case, we would all do well to make sure that we're giving all the glory to God as we set out to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Now someone else can come along and try to make my name be famous, and that's great, whatever, I'm just going to take that fame and turn around and say, it's all about Jesus. And that's my encouragement to you. When someone comes along and applauds you and tries to promote your name and, and, and give you fame, you just, yeah, sure. Let's redirect that right to Jesus where it belongs. Those who want to avoid the problem of pride, which can be caused by the fame of our own name, Well, in order to deal with this, it's crucial for Christians to remember that the Lord is the one who sends his servants to help us accomplish his calling. And and the reason why I'm pointing this out is because there's times, you know, when people begin to brag about something we're doing, there's there's times when people begin to applaud us for things that we've accomplished. And, and, And while we ought to redirect that glory to God, it's also important to remember that God has brought people alongside of us to help us to achieve the things that people are praising us for. Therefore, the famous believer who wants to remain humble should be quick to acknowledge those who God sent to help them. And and with this as the goal, let's consider the example of King Uzziah, which is found here in our text tonight. Look with me again there at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. We'll pick up our study there at verse 11. Here we learn that Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies according to the number on their roll as prepared by Jael, the scribe, and Maasiah, the officer, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600, and under their authority was an army of 300 and 7,500 that made war with mighty, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, mighty power. Uh, to help the king against the enemy. Then Uzziah prepared for them the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones. I'm... uh, uh, 
seeing here that uh, you know, he's outfitting his soldiers with everything they needed. And then we learn that he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. That's right, these guys started inventing weapons of war that they were using there on the towers. Pretty incredible. And Ezra here is describing the way that King Uzziah actually took the time to raise up other men by providing them with the training and the equipment and the opportunity that they all needed to succeed because he recognized that their success was his success. And listen, the more the military there in Judah succeeded, the more the name of King Uzziah increased in fame. At the same time, we must not fail uh, to notice what Ezra wrote there in the middle of verse 15. There again, we learn that he was marvelously helped till he became strong. He was helped. He was helped by the Lord, of course. But he was also helped by all these guys who come alongside of him and and are helping him to have this incredible military. And as we consider this statement, we can see here that King Uzziah was quick to give credit where credit was due. In this way, he was sharing the fame with those who were helping him uh, to make military advancements there in the land of Judah. And in light of his, his example, I believe that we would all do well to remember that every success that we experience in our lives was achieved with the help of others. If you think you're the self-made man or the self-made woman, you pulled up your you know, boots by the straps and you, you know, you're, you're the person that made it happen, you know, just don't forget. You didn't make yourself, did you? We have to remember that others have helped us along the way so that we can become successful. Others took the time and energy out of their own lives to invest in our development. We're, of course, talking about parents and teachers, friends and coaches, and the list could go on. Every success that we enjoy was made possible by the abilities that God has enabled us to develop naturally, but also with the people who came alongside us in order to help us to achieve every success. And with that being the case, you know, the Christian who begins to experience any level of fame would do well to just stay humble about it by acknowledging that, that there have been many people along the way who helped us to succeed. At the end of the day, every success that we experience is ultimately a gift of God's common grace. And with that being the case, those who experience any level of success and any level of fame ought to be quick to give God the glory. I like the way that the Lord put it in Jeremiah chapter 9. It's there where he declares, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Christian, listen, all of our success is ultimately a gracious gift of God. Therefore, rather than allowing our fame to become a source of personal pride, let's remember to redirect that glory to the one who truly deserves it. And that, of course, is Jesus. Now, one reason for why this is so important is because, listen, God rejects the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And those who exalt themselves, they're gonna be humbled. Those who exalt themselves are gonna be humbled by the Lord who will not share his glory, which belongs to him and him alone. In order to grasp my point, let's pick up our study of 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Here we learn about the way that pride ultimately destroyed King Uzziah. If you would look with me there at verse 16, here Ezra writes, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah 
and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Now here in these verses, we learn about this day when the pride of King Uzziah led him to cross a line that resulted in his dethronement and destruction. I like the way that the scholars who created the New Living Translation rendered verse 16. Here's how they put it. When he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord, his God, by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. In other words, the fame of King Uzziah became a source of pride. It all went to his head. He started believing his press. He started thinking about more of himself than he was about the Lord. And all of this led him to commit this transgression, which resulted in his downfall. Now, just to be clear, the word transgressed found there in verse 16, it's translated from a Hebrew word, which was used of those who commit a trespass by crossing over a boundary that in this context was established by the Lord. God had set specific boundaries for the temple, for the sanctuary, for who could you know, perform you know, offerings and burn incense and these sorts of things. There were specific boundaries that were set up and he crossed over them. King Uzziah crossed over the line when he assumed the role of the priest by personally burning incense there in the sanctuary. This was similar to the transgression that King Saul committed on the day when he offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. The story is actually found in 1 Samuel chapter 13. You can read it for homework if you like. In this story, we find the pride of King Saul, which led him to assume the role of the priest by offering a sacrifice unto the Lord. He grew weary of waiting for Samuel to arrive, and, and so he decided to take it upon himself to just present the Lord with a burnt offering. Unfortunately for him, this was a transgression that resulted in his dethronement. And one reason why is because he was assuming the position of the Messiah. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I should take a moment to remind you that the position of priest and the position of king, these were two distinct positions which were both designed to point to the promised Messiah who would alone fulfill both roles. The, the kings of Israel and the priests of Israel, the, these were two different groups. And, and while both positions pointed to the Messiah, the Lord kept these positions separate because there's only one who should fulfill both roles, and that is the Messiah. And so regardless of whether Saul knew it or not, you know, Saul was transgressing the command of God by assuming the identity of our Messiah when he, as a king, decided to offer a sacrifice to God. And it's for this reason that he had to be dethroned from that kingly position. In similar fashion, King Uzziah committed the same type of transgression on the day when he entered the temple of the Lord in order to burn incense there on the altar of incense. And this was the job which could only be completed by a consecrated priest there in Israel. Therefore, when King Uzziah trespassed by entering into the temple, he was assuming the position of the Messiah when he, as the king of Judah, tried to accomplish the work of the priest. Christian, listen, the Lord Jesus is the only one who was sent to fulfill the work of both king and and priest. In order to prove my point, I want to consider something that Paul wrote in his letter to the Hebrew believers there in the first century. And so hold your place here in 2 Chronicles. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. You see it's here in the final verse of Hebrews 6. This is where we find Paul. He's beginning to compare the ministry of the Lord Jesus to a mysterious man named Melchizedek. And as you make your way there to Hebrews 6, I just want to take a moment to point out that there is some debate about the identity of this intriguing individual. And yet, as far as my own studies go and, and the personal opinion that I've arrived at, I truly believe that Melchizedek is actually a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ who revealed himself to Abraham 2,000 years before the incarnate word of God was born to the Virgin Mary. And so this is what I believe to be a pre-incarnate manifestation 
of our Savior. With this in mind, if you would look with me here at Hebrews chapter 6. I want to draw your attention there to the last verse. There in the middle of verse 20, here Paul tells us that Jesus has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is a different order than the order of Aaron. So Jesus has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then then notice with me, Hebrews 7, verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which means peace, he's king of Salem, king of peace, and priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all he tithed, to Melchizedek here. First being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother. How does that work? Don't know. Without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Paul here is reminding his Hebrew audience about this this mysterious man named Melchizedek who has this intriguing ministry who, you know, met with Abraham there after the battle of the kings. Abraham tithes to him. And Paul tells us here that this Melchizedek is the king of peace and the priest of the most high God. I have a hard time seeing him as anything other than a pre-incarnate manifestation of God the Son. With all this being the case, listen, Jesus is the King of Peace. And he is the priest of the Most High God. And of course, I can appeal to many other passages to show you that Jesus is the King of Kings and that Jesus is the priest that that came and accomplished the priestly ministry. Uh, But this is just the the text that brings it all together in this mysterious man named Melchizedek. And with all that being the case, listen, King Uzziah was clearly crossing a crucial line when he tried to fulfill the ministry of the Messiah by fulfilling both roles as king and priest. And God had to step in and say, no, you don't get to do this. You don't get to do both roles here. That is for one individual, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Sadly, it was foolish pride that led him to think that he had the right to enter the temple. And it was the same pride uh, that led him to go and burn this incense in the sanctuary that also resulted in his downfall. And with this as the focus, let's turn our attention now back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. I want to consider the downfall of King Uzziah. If you would look with me there at verse 19, here we learn that Uzziah became furious and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house. because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah from first to the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote. So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings, for they said, he is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we learn about the way in which you know, the pride of King Uzziah resulted in the punishment of the Lord. And that's right, it was the Lord who struck him with this highly contagious disease of leprosy, even as he stood right there in the temple. And because he was a leper for the rest of his life, well, he remained ceremonially unclean and unable to even approach uh, the, the temple grounds at all. And all of this was simply because he was too proud to receive the rebuke of those priests. They came in and told him to get out, and he proceeded to try to offer that incense. And so the Lord struck him with leprosy. 
King Uzziah ended up suffering from leprosy until the day of his death because he simply would not repent. And being that he was a highly contagious uh, uh, leper who, who, you know, there, there was no natural cure for this disease at, at that point in time, you know, he ends up living in isolation for the rest of his life. Quarantined forever. Without debate, this is a perfect example of the warning that the Lord Jesus made in Luke chapter 14 where he declares, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let that sink in for a second. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And that's what happened to Uzziah. He exalted himself. Whether he knew it or not, he was exalting himself to the position of Messiah by taking on the role of a priest while being a king. And God said, no, I'm not going to allow this. And he wouldn't receive the rebuke, and so the Lord cursed him with leprosy. He exalted himself and found himself humbled for the rest of his life. Christian, listen, those who exalt themselves by placing their personal opinions above the word of God will eventually be humbled. Those who exalt themselves by robbing God of the glory that belongs to him, they will eventually be humbled. Those who exalt themselves by rejecting the rebuke of the servants of God, they will eventually be humbled. At the same time, we can also rejoice in knowing that those who will humble themselves will eventually be exalted. There's two options for us right there. Choose your path. Exalt yourself if if you'd like. And just wait for the humbling of the Lord. Or humble yourself and allow the Lord to exalt you. I encourage every believer to become the humble servant of our Savior. And, And let's continue to humbly serve our Savior for the rest of our lives so that we can rejoice in knowing that there is coming a day when we will be exalted. According to the scriptures, there's coming a day when the King of Kings and the priest of the Most High God will exalt those who place their faith in him. And according to the word of God, it's on that day when he will make us kings and priests of the Most High God.